Let me take this opportunity to remind ourselves that repetitive DNA sequences make up most of a eukaryotic genome. We'll see shortly that transposons make up a large proportion of that repetitive DNA. But first, let's look at the amazing work of Barbara McClintock, who first discovered mobile elements or transposons. So what did McClintock do? She actually found two mobile genetic elements in maize, that's corn, based on work she did in the 1940s and 50s. At that time, the scientific community believed that all genes had a permanent address or locus on their chromosome, and they couldn't accept that genes could change their address, meaning they couldn't accept the idea that they might move from their original address to a different chromosomal locus. And if it appeared otherwise, as it did after McClintock began publishing, it would seem to be a one-off, a rare and isolated phenomenon at best. What's truly remarkable is that McClintock discovered mobile genetic elements using conventional Mendelian genetic techniques, that is, doing crosses, breeding, and counting progeny. And she did it on triploid tissues. Gene cloning and recombinant DNA technologies were decades down the road. A rediscovery of uh, so-called jumping genes, transposons, using these techniques decades later finally convinced the world that transposons were real, widespread, and in fact a significant proportion of eukaryotic genomes. So some more maze amazement, just a side note as it says, McClintock not only studied these mobile genes, but was way ahead of her time in thinking about gene regulation and this thing called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the phenomenon of inheritance of patterns of gene expression, rather than just the genes themselves. It was a phenomenon that wasn't even named at the time she was working. All right, let's get back to reality. McClintock discovered mobile elements in the aluroni tissue of corn kernels. Let's look at maize reproduction and at these cells. All right, maize is monoecious, which means that corn plants are either male or female. They have separate male and female plants. Sperm produced in the tassels of male plants are spread during pollination to the stigma atop the silk of a female plant, as illustrated here. A pollen tube will grow through the silk, through which sperm will travel to the eggs or ovules. The eggs, also called the female gametophyte, are in what will become the embryo sac. Fertilization occurs when the sperm reaches the egg. But at the same time, the polar bodies, which result from meiosis in the female, are also fertilized by a sperm, and this results in a triploid cell. While the diploid embryo develops from the fertilized egg, the triploid fertilized polar bodies are what become the aluroni layer. So the, the aluroni cell layer consists of triploid cells. The triploid aluroni cells of the corn seed produce pigments called anthocyanins, and these give the kernels their color. The differential activity of enzymes that catalyze pigment production can cause variation in the color of seeds, as shown in this photograph. McClintock was interested in how the kernels on a single cob could show a range from colorless, that's white or yellow, to purple or dark brown or even variegated. She and others suggested that the genes involved in pigmentation were unstable and that they were altered in some but not other aluroni cells during seed development. Continued mitosis of cells with altered or mutated genes, along with that of cells in which the genes were unchanged, would lead to the colorful mosaic coloration of corn kernels that you can see on the mature cobs in the last photograph. To study this phenomenon, McClintock realized that she would be studying the genetics of triploid cells.